you have your Bibles this morning, take them and find with me Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 15. Last week we looked at the vision of the coming Christ, and this is part two of that message. I have been trying to preach these chapters, a single chapter each week, but this is, there's so much here in chapter 7 that I had to break this message up into two parts. So last week we talked about the first couple of uh, points here, the setting and the scenes in the vision. And this week we're going to be looking at the significance of the vision in verses 15 through the end of the chapter. You cannot help but notice the emphasis on the significance or the interpretation of the passage here because they're in verse 16. And of course in verse 15 Daniel is asking an angel for instruction to understand. In verse 16, he says that, uh, so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So uh, let's begin uh, in looking at the significance of the vision by reading in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to the one who stood by, as I mentioned, that's most likely an angel, and I asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, or that word can also mean kingdoms, and that's probably most likely the meaning here, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever even forever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth, which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and a times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. As we continue this week, We've looked at, as mentioned, the setting and the scenes of the vision. And as we look at the significance of the vision, I want you to see several things jumping right in as we begin to look at these verses. First of all, you'll notice that there are four earthly kingdoms. If you go back into verse 15 to 18, really there, especially in verse 17, he describes those great beasts, which are four, which are four kings, or as I mentioned, kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. Last week, if you remember, we talked about the four beasts that he saw in this vision, these animals. He's described seeing a lion. He described seeing a uh, bear, a leopard, and then an indescribable beast. And as I told you, as he's mentioned here, that uh, these kingdoms, they represent the Roman, excuse me, the uh, Babylonian Empire. It represents the Medo-Persian Empire. And uh, the third represents the Grecian Empire and the fourth, the Roman Empire, which also points forward to the kingdom of the Antichrist. But as you think about those four historical kingdoms, which have all been documented in human history, 
It reminds us that from the perspective of God, that God sees human kingdoms, no matter what their names are, as being depicted like animals, that we are animal-like. And while we also know, according to Genesis chapter 9, that God is the one who ordained human government, uh, the, the creation of human government was something that took place after the fall in Genesis 3. And so while God has ordained human governments to exercise a certain level of authority in a fallen and a broken world, to maintain some semblance of order, uh, keep in mind that because human governments are made up of humans who are sinful, then, then the potential for sin uh, in one sinner is bad enough, but the potential for sinners in an entire nation increases exponentially. And so by nature, human governments are also often godless, uh, oppressive, and, and very, very uh, wicked. And we can see this as we look back at the past of human civilization. And I use that word civilization very lightly. We talk about being the civilized world, but the civilized world has demonstrated the very worst kinds of atrocities known to mankind. We see it by looking at the past. We can also see it as we look around today in the present. And so we see this picture of the earthly kingdoms, these four earthly kingdoms. But the focus of Daniel's vision is not on the four earthly kingdoms, but instead on the future evil kingdom. And in verse 19 and following, you'll find that the last beast, that indescribable beast, is not simply the fourth kingdom that came on the earth, the Roman Empire, but it is also the speaks of the future and the final beast. Just to remind you, last week in verse 8, we talked about how he sees these horns, and then the little horn of verse 8 speaks of the Antichrist, that wicked, that future wicked leader who will take over the world, uh, the, 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 the uh, control political power of the world at the close of human history. And he said, what is the relationship between the Roman Empire and this final future king? I notice there in verse 24, he talks about the ten horns or king, ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. That's important, that word after them. You might want to underline that. And he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Uh, most interpreters have seen this as a way of saying that with the breakup of the Roman Empire, that, uh, that it really never completely disappears from the scene. Its influence is still felt, and the Roman Empire certainly has broken up into many kingdoms, and, and maybe at least from those kingdoms, there are at least ten that are preserved, that, that, that will continue in a smaller uh, form and fashion. And yet, as you think about this, it is from one of those kingdoms or from this line which the Antichrist will rise. The Bible does speak about such a figure, not simply here in Daniel. If it were just this obscure text, we might pass over it. But there are other passages which all point to this same climactic leader at the end of human history. And, and we know that in Second Thessalonians, he's called the man of lawlessness. We know that uh, John calls him, and that's the word that we most often use to refer to him, as the Antichrist. Uh, later in Revelation, John calls him the beast in keeping with Daniel. And, and as we consider the Antichrist and what he is like this morning, I believe it's important that we be scriptural and not sensational or speculative. I like what Dr. David Jeremiah said. He said, we don't know who he is. But we know what he is. And as we think about that here, it's important that as we think about all the Bible's teaching that we, like I said, we get we say scriptural, not speculative, uh, not sensational. Uh, it's important that we don't begin to name uh, the Antichrist anyone who has uh, three six-letter names. I mentioned last week Ronald Wilson Reagan was accused of being the Antichrist because he had three names with six letters each. And so they thought 666, the number of the beast, this is the Antichrist. It's also important that we don't become overly paranoid about even seeing the number 666. I, one time I received a license plate for a new vehicle with those Numbers, 666, I took it right back to the DMV, uh, not because I was afraid of the numbers, but because I was afraid of what that would do to me pulling up to a new church with uh, those numbers on my license plate. But when we think about that number 666, why does the Bible talk about its number being 666? You understand that six is the 
number of man. And this is what the Bible actually plainly says. If you go back and you study what it says about 666 in Revelation, six is the number of man. God created man on what day? The sixth day, right? And guess what? Seven is the number of God because God rested on the seventh day. And I believe what Revelation speaks of when it talks about 666 is simply this, is that the Antichrist, by the way, why is it three? And why is God in three? Why is it three sevens and, instead of uh, one seven? Because God is triune. And uh, each person of the Trinity is fully God. There is one God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And guess what? Revelation tells us that the Antichrist will try to mimic the Trinity, the unholy Trinity. It will try to mimic God. But while he will try to mimic God, 666 is always one short of 777. And the Antichrist and the kingdom of Satan will never reach God. And so we think about that. But also we, we want to be careful about getting speculative, about trying to play number games uh, with 666. But even the mark of the beast described over in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17, it says that some will take the mark of the beast and that uh, you cannot buy or sell without having that mark. In the 1980s, when barcodes became very prevalent, my grandmother was absolutely convinced that that was the mark of the beast because you could not buy or sell in the supermarket or wherever without it. And, and, and so we think about those things. And there's still, I hear people talk, talking today about microchips. You know, they're going to put a microchip in your hand or a microchip in your forehead, and that will be the mark of the beast. And, and some people have tried to do something like that. And there may be a sense in which that will take place. But let me just say this, that I don't even think that is the mark of the beast. Now, I don't want a microchip in my forehead. I don't want my banking information in my hand or someplace. I mean, I, during COVID, I've had to go and visit in nursing homes and they keep scanning my forehead with a with a forehead thermometer but i don't want to go to walmart and especially not to target and get my forehead scanned okay but regardless i don't even think that is the mark of the beast because you say well why do you believe that because revelation chapter 7 verse 3 talks about a seal being placed on the people of God. The people of God will be sealed just as those who follow the beast will have his mark but, but those who are sealed by the Lamb have the seal placed on them. And guess what? I know as being a Christian that we don't. there's no physical mark on my body that uh, means I'm a believer. The mark of the new covenant is to be baptized, but that doesn't leave a permanent mark upon your body. I believe that simply the, the uh, seal that comes upon us for trusting Christ is our allegiance, our loyalty to Christ. And in that same way, the mark of the beast is to give your allegiance to the Antichrist and to his godless government. And if you give that allegiance, then you will be accepted. And if you do not give that allegiance, you will be ostracized financially, physically, in all kinds of ways. And again, that, those are just my thoughts on this, reading scripture and trying to understand this. But let me just share as we think about these signs and how we understand it before we look more at Daniel 7. I, I think it's important to understand uh, that that we need to know what the Bible says and keep these prophecies tucked in the back of our minds without being absolutely dogmatic about what they mean. As I mentioned before, David Jeremiah said it best. He says, we, know, we don't know who he is, we know what he is. And I like the analogy I read one time of a pastor. He described uh, kind of like reading directions in the days before GPS. Some of you remember that. And uh, even when GPS technology came out for a long time, uh, I didn't have one. I didn't have a GPS. I had this thing you could kind of put on your dash and mount to try to plug into your cigarette lighter when they still had those in cars. And you'd ride around. But before that, you'd have to write down directions. And this man described that one day he was going to visit way out in the country. And he had directions to this particular house. He said, and on the direction, somebody had written down, turn right at the sign high and into the intersection. And he said, I didn't have a clue what it meant to turn right at a sign high and into the intersection. He said, but as I rounded a curve, I looked and said, 20 feet off the ground from a tree limb, there was a sign, a street sign hanging that stuck out into the intersection. He said, when I saw it, I had no doubt about what was meant. And I believe that is the way it is when we read about the second coming of Christ and the end times. If we know what the scripture says, when we see it, we'll understand it. And so what do we learn about the Antichrist and his future evil kingdom from Daniel? I want to share with you a few things here. And if you're taking notes, uh, you can put these are not on the screen, but you can, you can add these as well. Daniel tells us about the power of the Antichrist. Look at verses 19 and 20, as well as 23 and 24. And you'll find that while many 
superpowers have come in human history. He says in verse 20 that this one's appearance was greater than his fellows. Verse 23 says he will devour the whole earth. I understand that the Antichrist will have a control and a power that has never been seen in human history hence before this. In uh, Revelation 13, verse 7, it says, and, uh, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Throughout human history, the goal of many leaders has been to worldwide dominion. You can see it. It all started in Genesis 11 when, uh, when Nimrod tried to build this city called Babel. And he wanted to unite all the peoples of the earth together. And he wanted to build this great city in the face of God. But if you remember there that God destroyed that plan, he's destroyed plans that have tried to follow the same path ever since, from whether it be the plans of a Pharaoh, whether it be the plans of Nebuchadnezzar or Napoleon. But yet in the final days, God is going to remove that restraint, and there will be such a leader who will come onto the scene of history, who will establish a one-world government. Does that mean that he'll control every single nation? Well, even if he doesn't control every nation militarily, he'll at least control them through treaties or through the economic uh, plan of the world. So we know that there's this great power of the Antichrist, but the Bible also tells us about the perception, the intelligence of the Antichrist. Look at verse 20. It says, that horn which had eyes. Now, you know that a horn doesn't have eyes. You've never seen a beast that had an eye on a horn. But it speaks of, this little horn speaks of the Antichrist, it's a little horn, it starts out small, but it becomes great. And, and yet this little horn has eyes. That speaks of his intelligence, his ability to see and be brilliant. And the Antichrist will be brilliant. He'll be charismatic. He'll be popular. I, he's not the kind of person that everyone is going to hate from the get-go. He, he's going to be loved by many. And I believe as you look at human history, you can see that anyone who has gained power, who has become a dictator, most of them have done so by being very cunning, but by being a master of malarkey. And that's certainly the way it was in Germany. When you think about uh, Adolf Hitler, you, you look at the time that he came to power in Germany, and it was a time when they talk about having to carry their money to the bank and, and to the store in a wheelbarrow. I mean, that was how bad the inflation was. That was how bad the economy was. And he was able to get them out of that economic situation. And I think that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be the kind of man who's so brilliant that he's going to be able to solve the world's woes, and he's going to be able to cover people's eyes and pull the wool over people's eyes. And I think that's the kind of thing that's going to happen in the end, end times. Vladimir Lenin said this. He said, the surest way to overthrow an existing social order is to destroy its currency. I believe that what that's, that tells us. Now, I'm not saying the Antichrist is going to come because of what's happening in America, but I believe that what we see happening in America and what's happening around the world, the, the, the time is ripe for this kind of thing to take place. And when the economy gets bad enough, people will let someone do almost anything to fix it. And so we think about through false signs of duplicity, he'll deceive the world. And uh, it's often through this kind of perception, this cunning, this, this uh, deceit that the Antichrist gains power. And guess what? You're not going to immediately recognize this person as being a bad person. In fact, if I were to try to fool you with counterfeit money, I wouldn't go get some Monopoly money that was pink and hand it to you. I would try to find something that looked as much like the real thing to deceive you, and the Antichrist will look like a great ruler. By the way, can I remind you that in 1938, Adolf, the year before he invaded Poland, Adolf Hitler was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. That's the kind of person that the Antichrist will be. And those who have not received the gospel will be deceived. Let me say it again. If you've not received the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be deceived when the Antichrist comes. By the way, the, the Bible shows it's not just about the Antichrist, but about everything. All throughout the scriptures, the, the Bible cont continually teaches that if those who reject the truth of God always believe the lies of Satan. Those who didn't receive the light of God in Jesus Christ believe the darkness. And if, you, if the Antichrist is revealed tomorrow, if you've not accepted Christ today, you will be deceived. And so we know about the power and the perception of the Antichrist, but also look at verse 20 and notice the pride of the Antichrist. It says, a mouth which spoke 
pompous words. <laughs> this little mouth has this little horn has a big mouth, and intelligence and pride are always a deadly combination. And his pride doesn't simply start at a kind of an arrogance, a human arrogance, but it moves on to the profaneness of the Antichrist. Notice there in verse 25, it says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall intend to change times and laws. If you skip down, he mentions the changing of times and laws. Now, his pride knows no limits. The Antichrist will present himself as if he were God, and he will demand the glory and the allegiance that should be given to God and God alone. Many totalitarian leaders in human history have exercised the same kind of arrogance of demanding worship that belongs to God and him only. I think of a documentary I once watched on North Korea. And Kim Jong-il, uh, who's deceased now, uh, he, he had, whenever he wanted, he wanted these people to worship him, so he put images, he put his face everywhere in North Korea. And one day he heard about a man who had been blind. But a small, a simple procedure, surgical procedure, could cure this man's blindness. So he paid for this man to have the surgery. And immediately after the surgery, he was blindfolded. And he was taken into a room where there was this image of the supreme leader of North Korea. And the blindfold was removed so that the man could bow in homage to the man who had cured his blindness. You see, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. A man who wants to be worshipped, who wants the glory that belongs to God for himself. And the Antichrist will demand allegiance and he will be anti Religion. I believe that he'll be anti-religion of any kind. And, and when it says here to change times and laws, most people believe that refers to religious holidays as well as the laws of the land. He's going to want to start over completely. And by the way, may I remind you that 1 John speaks about the Antichrist, the final Antichrist, but it also says you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, but many Antichrists have come. And the spirit of the Antichrist, he says later in and I think chapter 4, is already at work in the world. I believe that today that the spirit of the Antichrist, and not just today, but throughout history, the spirit of the Antichrist has always been at work, and the spirit of the Antichrist has been at work in the United States for a long time. By the way, when it talks about changing times, religious holidays, and changing laws, can't we, we can certainly see it. I mean, right now we're celebrating Christmas, right? And, and that is the celebration of Christ's birth. We've seen it, we've seen a war, a secular, uh, secularization is waging war on that which is sacred. And we can see that people want to change Christmas to the holidays, and we want to take Jesus out of everything. We want to change times, make it a holiday season rather than Christmas. And you can see that in other places as well. There's to the try to replace what is authentic with that which is false. And not only is there that, but also the changing laws. And we can see it in America today, the spirit of the Antichrist is busy at work trying to replace the laws and the morality of God with the laws and the morality of Satan. I read, and I, I didn't read the whole story, but I saw where they were talking about the Mormon church had, uh, had got on board and, and the LDS church had, had supported the uh, redefinition of marriage. And some people acted like they were surprised by that, that they thought the LDS was at least politically conservative. Let me just say something. LDS movement, Mormonism began as an antichrist movement. Its founder, Joseph Smith, was an antichrist because John says that anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ is an antichrist. Those who deny true doctrine are antichrist. And the Mormon church started out that way, so why are we going to be surprised when they get on board with the Antichrist in the end times? Uh, and so there's the Antichrist profaneness and also the Antichrist persecution. Notice in verse 21 and then again in verse 25, he says, The horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Verse 25 says, He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And then he says, Then the saints shall be given into his hand. You've probably figured it out by now, but the prefix anti means against so the antichrist is against christ that means he wants to destroy the work of christ including his 
church. He wants to destroy believers. Many antichrists have already come. Men like uh, Pharaoh and Antiochus and Nero and Diocletian and Hitler and Stalin. But there's a final antichrist who is coming. And the Bible, when it says the saints shall be given into his hand, that doesn't mean he's going to win. It means that he's going to persecute the saints. He's going to persecute the church. And while he may be able to kill the body, he cannot kill the soul. And he will not win because Jesus said that this on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it and while there is this persecution of believers it is only for a time because we find here about the period of the antichrist rule verse 25 says for a time and times and a time, half a time and that's talking about the length of time that he's going to persecute the church according to uh, daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 the reign of the antichrist will last about seven years that, again, we'll get into that a little bit more when we get to chapter 9, talking about this tribulation period. But uh, before we even get into we know about seven years he's going to reign. Uh, will the church realize that the anti Antichrist is on the scene? Will we see the uh, Antichrist on the scene of human history? Well, absolutely. Uh, the Second Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 3 says that, the day of the Lord, that's the return of Christ, the day of the Lord will not come until the man of lawlessness, which is the Antichrist, is revealed. And so the Antichrist will appear on the scene of human history. But, but while he will appear, and by the way, he could already be in the world for all I know. He may or may not be, I don't know. But about three and a half years into his reign, about halfway through his seven-year reign, his true colors will be seen. At first, he's going to have everybody duped, just like Hitler. 1938, man of the year. He's going to have everybody uh, wool pulled over everyone's eyes. But notice here it talks about a time, which most believe is one year. Times, most people believe, is two years. And a half a time being six months. Altogether, about three and a half years. And, and, and at the end of his seven-year reign, the all-out onslaught against Christians and against the church is going to begin. And the church, the, the night will always be the darkest before the dawn. We've heard that before, and it's certainly true here, that the night will get darkest before the dawn. And oh, he is attacking the people of God, uh, Israel, and he's attacking uh, those who follow the Lamb. We know this, that not only do we see the four earthly kingdoms that we can see in history, and we not look forward to the future to think about the final evil kingdom, but bless God, there's going to be a final eternal kingdom. There's going to be a future evil kingdom, but there will be a final eternal kingdom. Because you and I cannot help but feel fearful at the thought of an antichrist. We wonder, well, if, if uh, we're going to at least see part of his reign, if we're going to be here uh, to at least when he's initially unveiled, then, then what, what is the future like? Uh, what, will, what will happen to us if believers are dying? And, of course, Revelation talks about martyrs, and we know that people will lose their life for their faith. And it becomes very frightening. We know this, there's a final eternal kingdom. When I say final, I mean final because there are no other kingdoms coming after it. Man may rule empires, but only the Son of Man reigns eternally. And what do we know about his kingdom? It begins with a decree from God. Verse 26 says, but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his, that's the Antichrist's dominion. In Revelation chapter 5, I believe John describes the same thing that Daniel describes in this verse. John describes seeing a divine courtroom in heaven. And in this courtroom, they're calling for someone who can open the title deed to the universe and bring history to its climactic conclusion. But a search is made and there is no one who is able to open the scroll and to break its seals. And John says that he began to weep because there is no hope for humanity. Every tear will remain on our cheeks. Justice will never be served. Lost causes will stay lost. Hearts will stay broken. And evil will continue unabated. But just as it appears that evil will win, John says, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. 
You see, God's final eternal kingdom will commence with a decree from God. And Christ, who from the time that he ascended to heaven has remained seated, will finally stand up. Oh, it begins with a decree from God, and it brings destruction to the godless. Notice here in verse 26, he says, to consume and destroy it. That means the kingdom of the Antichrist forever. When Jesus stands up, the time clock on this world will stop. It's a time up, time's up, it's over, the game is finished. And when Jesus stands up, the sky is going to open up. And John puts it like this, Revelation chapter, chapter 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on, it, on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Then listen to what he says in verse, in verse uh, 19. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That's us. And I saw the beast and the kings and their armies, and they were gathered, and the beast was captured. And with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Listen, Jesus is coming. When he talks about that sword which proceeds from his mouth, do you think he's going to have to wage a physical sword? Absolutely not. His word is his weapon. Someone said, what's Jesus going to say to destroy all those who are arrayed against him? We don't know, but I like what one person, he said, drop dead. And that'll be done. He will destroy evil. Not only will it begin with a decree from God and bring destruction to the godless, but it'll bring deliverance to the godly. I understand this, that when Jesus comes, you and I are going to be rescued. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book of life. When Jesus returns, when Jesus stands up, he's going to step on on a cloud. And you and I and those who have died in Christ, we're going to rise together to meet the Lord in the air. And we are going to be delivered. And those who have persecuted, those who have attacked him, the wicked and the unbelieving will be destroyed. And the final eternal kingdom of God will be decreed by God, bringing destruction to the godless and deliverance to the godly, and he will bestow dominion to the godly. Look at verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Christ is going to come, and he will establish an everlasting kingdom, Daniel says, on the earth, and the saints will reign with Christ the King over creation. Those who have endured trials and tribulations will experience triumph. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21 puts it like this, to him who overcomes, of course we know that's by the blood of the Lamb, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I can't even begin to imagine what that will be like. I don't believe Daniel could even begin to imagine what that would be like, and that's why, verse 29, he says, My thoughts troubled me greatly, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. I kept the matter in my heart. And I hope that those of you here this morning will do the same. There are two ways that you can respond to this message. Because as I look across this congregation this morning, there are two kinds of people here. Some of you are lost. Some of you have never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and put him first place, number one, in your heart and in your life. You might have prayed a prayer, you might have walked an aisle, you might have got dunked in some water, but you never made Jesus the Lord of your life to sit upon the throne of your heart and call the shots in your life. And you know that today. I want you to understand that if you are an unbeliever here, 
not because you don't believe historically, but because you've never made him Lord of your life, that if you make sure that you choose to be delivered by Christ today so that you will not be destroyed tomorrow. Christ has overcome the world and he has won the victory over Satan and the Antichrist in the world by the cross. And if you are going to overcome, if you're going to win the victory, if you're going to be standing, when everything else falls apart, then you must overcome by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by believing that he died to cover your sins and that he rose again, that you can live with him. And if you accept that truth of Christ today, you cannot be received by the Antichrist or the spirit of the Antichrist, which is even already in the world. And in just a moment, I'm going to be standing here at the front, and if there's going to be some invitation counselors that are going to be coming. And if you have never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I just want to ask this morning that you'd have the boldness to stand up from your seat and walk down and say, I want to know that I know Jesus. But I also want to say a word to those who are believers here because to us, this is a message of hope. Like Daniel, keep this matter in your heart. Hide the word of God in your heart. What does the Bible say we ought to be doing? We ought to be working, we ought to be watching, and we ought to be praying until the Lord comes. And don't let your focus be on the Antichrist. Let it be on Christ. There's a lot of things right now that are discouraging you and are discouraging me, whether it be a personal situation or a political situation. But guess what? Here's the good news. Here's the encouragement this morning because some of you need it. We win. 777 is going to destroy 666. The Ancient of Days will crush the Antichrist. The beast will be slain by the coming of the bridegroom. And the kingdom of Satan will fall before the kingdom of the Son. Like a child who was afraid as the night begins to draw near and as he begins to dream of monsters. We read Daniel's dream of these monsters and as we see the night approaching, it causes us to be fearful. But in this chapter that began by describing four predators, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and an indescribable beast, that's frightening because guess what? We're sheep. And those kinds of predators eat sheep. But when Daniel saw those predators, those beasts coming, he also said, I saw the Son of Man coming. That one like the Son of Man is a shepherd. He sees the lion coming. He sees the bear coming. He sees the leopard coming. He sees the beast coming, and he does not flee because he's a good shepherd. And like David, his forefather, according to the flesh, Christ, the Son of Man and the Son of David, will kill the beasts which come to feed on his sheep. Father God, we are so thankful that you are a good shepherd. Lord, that you will protect us and that while we live in this world that wants to destroy us, that you have overcome the world and that you will destroy those who want to destroy us. Lord, will you deliver everyone who calls on your name? Lord, I thank you that you are a good God. Lord, that you honor the decision that is made. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us this morning with your coming. Help us to look for you and not be distracted by the Antichrist which may come. And Lord, I also pray this morning, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who's never prayed to receive you as Savior and Lord, this morning as the hymn of invitation is sung, that wherever they may be seated, they'd step out and leave this place knowing that they've settled their account with you. Lord Jesus, come and by your Holy Spirit, do your work among us. We ask these things in his name. Amen.